Oh, yeah. That's the stuff. O-M-G. <laughs> what a unique, weird movie. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that maybe it was just... It was a perfect storm um, because of one, uh, the pandemic was keeping people out of the theaters and also Disney needed to keep adding stuff to Disney Plus to keep that streaming service like the people coming more and more to it. I think if they were like, oh man, we got to put this in the theaters, so we got to take all this... We got to tone down the weirdness. We've got to actually um, make the relationship between May and her parents more uh, uh, palatable. I think that would have suffered a lot. Like I remember, I remember the sandwich of of Luca, which was pretty wonderful. I liked it. It was a, it was a quaint and charming story about you know uh, unforgettable summer. Even then, you have this, which is just so so full of character and so full of interesting choices and so like may i say bold in its interpretation for like centering around a young girl who is obviously going through uh her puberty the mother's freaking out about it the father's just ducked out as you could see and it actually like tackles a lot of those those subjects of growing and again, I think if they were like, well, no, this needs to be in theaters. We've got to just like, we got to tiptoe around all this nonsense instead of sort of like really engaging with it in a meaningful way to actual humans and not demographics. It's no coincidence that the, the, the first Pixar movie to be featured in theaters recently is just like the safest bet, in my opinion, just like extremely bland. What if Overwatch was a brown shooter? May I remind you what real men look like? <gasps> For town. Okay, so I was wondering why this movie took place in the like early 2000s, and I guess it's because of the boy band. There, there was such a specific time, a specific like cultural zeitgeist that was directed towards young prepubescent girls. Um, speaking of the boy band, one thing I like of this movie is that there wasn't any point where like she shows up to like a, a record signing or something like that and there wasn't like a crooked manager who was like oh we're gonna sign you up and and you're gonna be the next big thing my and you know hired old sort of trope about oh no fame gets to her head they sort of sidestep that whole pitfall and uh, I'm grateful for that. In fact, Four Town step up and they actually help save the day. So there's nothing like sinister about them. They are really just like window dressing to the story. And I thought that was just, I don't know. I was waiting for a shoe to drop, but there was, it, the shoes stayed firmly attached to everyone's feet. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> opening really just uh, demonstrates how sort of appropriate it is that it takes place in the early 2000s um, because it just it just reminds me so much of like things like Hey Arnold and Pepper Ann and Doug you know they weren't about like robots or monsters or secret lives they were just about kids and all the stuff that they were dealing with so I was just like oh man I just got a huge burst of nostalgia from that and that's probably why this whole thing sort of resonates yeah you know uh, people like in their 30s right now i think a lot of that just comes from the strength of just how expressive everything is it's like really good models really good staging girls are so animated everybody's a little animated the community the buildings they have just like a great sense of comedic timing are you a werewolf? No! What? He's a red panda! Sick. You're so floppy! You're so floppy! I've always wanted a tail. Free up. An amazing soundtrack as well. Again, maybe that's why it reminds me of Hey Arnold, the sort of urban and also jazzy flute. Which is also May's instrument. And I think early on you hear between the earlier section, which was like really like upbeat and jazzy and urbane. And then you have this sort of more um, Chinese inspired. And so I think it's a good way of signifying that there's two sides to 
May and just her life at this point, her her life at school with her friends and sort of the, the hustler that she sees she is, and then this sort of partnership she has with her mother taking care of the temple. What What is it when a, a certain instrument represents a character? I don't know. We'll ask, uh, we'll have to ask Musical Health what that is. What? What is not? Huh? What? Mom! Oh. Oh. Huh? Huh? This part really stuck out to me uh, because you have the mother. I noticed her hand gestures. She's sort of, her hand movements look like that of a politician. She does, you know, the hand wave, the, the finger gestures and all that. I was like, at first I was like, okay, that totally fits her character. Someone who just is kind of stuffy and uh, tries to communicate what they, in a way that's not talking down, but also talking down. But then I realized in like this scene beforehand, she's like way more animated. Like she, look at that. She's just kind of flipping out, um, still staying reserved um, as much as possible. But then I realized there's a switch between that moment and this moment where she goes into the spiel or the, the speech that she's probably been preparing ever since May was born. It's a, an incredibly subtle way of showing the process of what's going on in her in her mind. She's freaking out, but at the same time, she's trying to remain composed because that's the her way of combating what her family sees as an ailment. And I just think it's like it was just really nice. There's um, it's a very ch good change of pace to sort of the. Oh, overbearing parental figures that have been like the dreck of certain animated movies. Like I'm, I'm trying to think of something that's been like on the on the the level of King Trident, you know, in Little Mermaid. But I can't I can't quite think of anything recently. I think that died out around the 2000s, and now you have this more nuanced look into both the process of a parent and a child, which I think this is like really interesting. You can watch this as a kid and be like, oh, crap, puberty. Or you can watch this as a parent and be like, oh, crap, puberty. I know what that feels like. Or I have the same emotional distress about what my child is going through. And I wish I wish the best for them. Treating her own mother like that. Me? It's your mother. I'm not here. This part coming up is really, I find it really uncomfortable. And I know it's meant to be very uncomfortable because it's meant to be distressing. But I wonder if they sort of knew they were, uh, if they were aware of the parallels between like this, which is sort of like a legitimate paranormal crisis. Like I'd be damned if I could figure out how to, what's the best solution for a, me or a family member being possessed by a sort of warrior spirit animal. And sort of like the parallels between that and the real world families sequestering maybe people with like mental illnesses, uh, hoping to quote unquote pray the demon away. I'm, yeah, and that had to have like crossed their minds. And so that's why they sort of, the thing that gets May out of it is, again, sort of the love of her family, sure, but it's mainly the outside world, like the love of her friends. There's a devastating line when i start to get emotional all i do is imagine the people i love most in the whole world which is you guys nay, nay. oh it hurts but it's also kind of true again yeah it's her friends that allow her to overcome and, and learn how to control this ability oh it's our love we're like a warm and fuzzy blanket yeah Okay, so a lot of people got real pissy about this movie, saying that, oh no, it teaches the wrong message about, you know, disobeying your parents and, and their family and everything. And this has been pointed out a million times, like The Little Mermaid, or Aladdin didn't start that crap. So yeah, this is mainly about, like, this is when May sort of defies her family, wants to keep her panda, and uh, that's her choice. Yeah, I could see an interpretation of that. There's a lot of different ways of reading this movie. I think the main point is, is that yes, growing as a person takes some push and pull, understanding 
who you are, where you're coming from, but also giving people opportunity to grow on their own. Uh, you know, and the generational trauma, which is a big theme for uh, Disney recently. This and Encanto. Luca, I guess. That's another sort of theme, repressing sort of the... Uh, instilling fear, mainly, of the other. I think the more poignant message of this movie is sort of the the healing and understanding and learning where people are coming from and growing from there. And I think this scene is actually really, really beautiful because of it. I was saying, it's it, there are so many different interpretations and so many conflicting sort of... Uh, you could argue that the, he's she's disobeying her family, but at the same time embracing her tradition, which is also just like another part of her family. So it's there are definitely different readings of this movie. You're not going out like that, are you? <sighs> my panda, my choice, mom. <laughs> I'll be back before dinner, okay? Fine. Okay, so this is one thing I noticed. And I didn't notice it until I moved from my phone to a much bigger TV screen. Like the lines around her mouth. Just look at that. I think they're actually drawn on, like their line art projected onto the model. You know how they um, they did it in Spider-Verse. Where in Spider-Verse it was very obvious that the eyebrows and, and some of the like line work, it was meant to dictate that... Oh, uh, they're, you know, this is like a comic book style. Here, I think it's it's just ever so subtle. The, the, the colored choice that they use, it blends in with the model. It blends in with the world. So you're, you're, it's not, you're not immediately drawn to it, but it adds a, a certain extra aesthetic to the whole thing. It's very obvious when you do things like change the eye to a different texture. Like the shimmer, that's a texture. And it's just projected on the model. You're not actually, and you don't need to change the topology. So it's not like they're adding an extra crease to the model. A very subtle texture that doesn't take away or draw you out of the movie. In fact, you probably don't even notice it. Uh, but your brain did. So now I'm looking all over this movie now with a fine-toothed comb trying to figure out what other little uh, tricks they've been pulling. 